I am doing my 2023 favorites. It is January. What is the date? It is January 9th as I'm recording this. And so you um, very well, much will not see this until the second week of January. But it's okay. I'm here. And I'm here to present you with my favorite reads. I decided to do, I think it's a top 12, to be honest. Um, why a top 12? Because it was a top 10 and then I remembered some more. And so it became a top 12. Sorry. It's just more books for you. Let's start. These are ranked. So this is my bottom ish. The ranking would change if you asked me tomorrow. Like the ranking, except probably the top two, like flexible. But this is where we landed. And so this is where we're going to land for this video. And in 12th place, we have The Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston. And I really debated putting her other book. I read both of the Ashley Poston books that are out right now The Seven Year Slip and The Dead Romantics on this list. And I wound up putting The Seven Year Slip. This spot was like really contentious. I actually read a lot of really good romance this year. Ashley Poston writes these lightly speculative women's fiction rom coms. They remind me a lot of like Rebecca Surly. If you've read either of her books, The Dinner List, In Five Years, One Italian Summer, like all of them have this like slight speculative speculative edge to a story that is like otherwise pretty normal, pretty like contemporary standard rules. So this one follows this woman. Clementine, which is like the trendiest girl name right now. Anyway, this woman's name is Clementine, and she inherits her aunt's apartment at the beginning of this novel. Her aunt has died. She's inheriting this apartment. It's a beautiful Manhattan apartment, and at the same time, she's feeling kind of stuck, and she's kind of just feeling very stagnant in her life. She has a job that she, like, is good at, and she, like, enjoys-ish, but she's kind of feeling a little bored at, just kind of feeling like she's not going anywhere with. She hasn't traveled. She used to travel all the time with her aunt, but now she hasn't been traveling as much. She used to do a lot of, like, art as, like, a fun hobby, and she's not doing it as much. She's just feeling kind of stalled out, and she's inherited this apartment, and her aunt has two rules for the apartment. One, you have to take your shoes off when you come in. Two, you can't fall in love with anyone in the apartment. You know why? Because this apartment can time travel. In that, sometimes you walk in the apartment door and you're seven years in the past. Like, just the apartment itself. Like, if you walk back outside, present day. But in the apartment, it will be seven years earlier. And you can never tell what it's going to happen. It's, like, very unpredictable. You have no control over it. She stayed in this apartment. One day, she comes in and there's a man in there. And she's upset because no boy's allowed, obviously. Um, but it comes to find out that this man had rented her aunt's apartment for the summer seven years prior and so now like they are in the same space because the apartment has traveled back in time it like it's confusing to explain but honestly in the book it makes a lot of sense so maybe i will stop and so obviously because of the walk to remember rule if you state like you cannot fall in love in a romance novel that is exactly who you'll fall in love with so they have this like cute little romance it is very much like the bear like that show about restaurant i've never watched a single episode my impression of the bear meets 13 going on 30 and that it's like a cutesy wholesome time traveling situation also he's a cook he's a chef and there's a lot of conversations around food which is fun i really enjoyed it um it was a good time next on my list number 11 was the first book i read in 2023 and i always try to start my year off with like a good book this year i started it with check and mate by ali hazelwood which was a delicious choice. But last year I started it with Daisy Hates, The Great Undoing, the most recent book in the Magnolia Parks, those guys right there, series um, by Jessa Hastings. The next one comes out in February. I'm dying to read it. I'm so excited. So this book follows Daisy Hates, her brother Julian, and her love interest Christian. We get all three of their perspectives. And it's following, the series is kind of a confusing setup. Okay, Magnolia Parks is a little confusing. And it's definitely like a book that you either love or hate. I love it. Like this book is so for me. Like it's a book for me. But it's not a book that I'm like a deep evangelist of. Like some books I'm like, oh, this book is like so good everyone should love it. And if you don't like it, I'm like, something's wrong with you. This is one of those books where if you don't get it, you don't get it. And like that's sad for you, but like there's nothing I can do to change your mind. So anyway, this is the fourth book in the series. We're following the the books are kind of done in pairs where we get a Magnolia book and then a Daisy book and they follow the same time period, but they're from their different perspectives. And so this one we are following the most recent Magnolia book. But I like the Daisy books better. Just a little bit. Like, I love Mags and BJ, the narrators in her books. But, like, Daisy and her brother Julian. Julian is my favorite. Anyway, this book is, like, Drama Town, USA. But anyway, if you are a Magnolia Parks girl like I am, I am planning... I, like, hate to say this because what if I don't actually follow through? But I'm, like, planning pretty hardcore to do a recap of the Magnolia Parks books. Like, I've been doing a recap of the Throne of Glass books for before the next book comes out so like right before they come out in February I'm gonna do like a two-parter with like the first two books and the second two books I'm hoping fingers crossed I also am just like due for a reread like I just love these books so much next I read Happy Place by Emily Henry if you've been around this channel for more than one second you know that I'm an Emily Henry fangirl I have like a weird parasocial attachment to this woman and I love all of her books I've read every single book she's written 
like not just her adult stuff but all her YA stuff her co-written stuff like I love her so much and so obviously when a new novel comes out it's an auto buy for me I bought this one and saved it for my trip to Nashville I went to Nashville for my sister's birthday this year and we went and saw Taylor Swift and it was gorgeous and amazing and spectacular and I was also reading this novel and it was just like such a beautiful experience honestly this one is like much more women's fiction it follows Wynne and Harriet who were like college sweethearts they met in college um, and they were part of this like larger friend group in college they fell in love and now years later they were engaged and they've broken off their engagement but they haven't told anyone they've broken off their engagement yet and so they both get invited on this big college friend group trip that they've been taking every summer for years it's actually how they first met and it's in this house in Maine but it's going to be the last summer they're gonna be able to spend at this house in Maine because the girl who Stanley owns it is selling it and so it's like really special there's some other reasons this becomes like a very special weekend and um Harriet doesn't want to ruin it and so they decide to like fake date essentially to pretend that they're still engaged for the duration of this trip just like to not bring down the vibes and it is I cried so much in this book um and when might be my favorite Emily Henry man the competition is stiff um his like biggest competition for me is Alex Nielsen because I just think Alex Nielsen is top tier but it, at one point when says to Harriet in every universe it's you for me even if it's not me for you okay I'm just going to take like a super quick nap on the highway. Next up for favorite books, something I'm a little bit biased on because it was written by my friend um, Chelsea and Chelsea and I have become friends over the last year because we both had books coming out in 2023 and I absolutely loved her book. It was very different than mine but like so delightful and I got to read it and have lots of author events so I got to spend a lot of time talking with her about her book which made it even more like exciting and more fantastic for me um, and so that is Witches at the End of the World by Chelsea Iverson. This is a historical fantasy that takes place in like I believe it's 17th century Norway and follows these two sisters during this period where there were a lot of witch hunts going on. And so when the book opens these sisters have been living in the wilderness for like decades at this point. They moved out there when they were small children after their mother was burned at the stake for being a witch. And they moved out there with her grandmother to keep them safe because um, obviously suspicions would fall on them if their mother was considered a witch and they are both witches like they both are witches with magic powers and like do spells and things so it was a dangerous time for them and so they moved out into wilderness and they lived out in the wilderness but then their grandmother dies and they are kind of like faced with this choice and the sisters both go in different directions and so um we have Kaya and Kaya decides that she wants to go back to the city she wants to go back and live in town so she can start a family and like be a part of a community she wants a much softer life and her sister um Minna decides that she is much more comfortable in the wilderness and they like diverge and we watch as their paths diverge and we kind of watch as the what the repercussions of that damage that relationship and some choices that um Minna makes in particular um that really mm, and some not great choices that have like very strong ripple effects this book was like so incredibly atmospheric I feel like right now is like the perfect time to read it it is definitely like a wintry book like a lot of it takes place in the winter in Norway and we're talking about like snow and bears and forests and it's just like so deeply atmospheric um it is not like although it is like classed as a fantasy it is a much like lighter fantasy I would almost kind of compare it to Babel not at all in setting and tone but in terms of like how big of a role magic plays like magic is clearly important is is something that continues to be like a uh, part of the spirit of this novel but you're not like having like I don't know it's not like a high fantasy where there's like fey that they're like hanging out with such a great read and like such an amazing setting if you love a sister story this is amazing chelsea has a bunch of sisters so like i feel like the sister dynamic was captured beautifully next up we have another romance who beat out miss emily henry in terms of favorite romances this is like a tough spot but i had to give it to you, part of your world by abby jimenez actually again loved both of abby jimenez's books i read this year i read part of your world and yours truly but part of your world just barely edged out yours truly in terms of my favorite um this gives me such strong heart of dixie vibes which is one of my favorite television shows of all time which if you don't know heart of dixie it's about this doctor who is from new york city and gets moved to like a small town in alabama gorgeous tv show side rack but this is about a doctor in chicago she is like part of this doctor dynasty like there is just like a legacy of her family being doctors at this particular big hospital in chicago but one day when she is driving back to chicago she I think drives into a ditch. 
she's like a minor car accident and winds up having this encounter with the mayor of this tiny town that's like several hours outside of Chicago and like pretty quickly they fall in love with each other and the crux of this story and why I found it kind of so compelling as a romance novel is it's not them falling in love mostly I mean that's definitely a part of it and it's gorgeous and amazing and fantastic but it's mostly about you trying to figure out how they're going to make this work because they come from like two different worlds hence the title which I don't think is actually a Little Mermaid reference which I did think it was for the longest time it's like got all of the good small town vibes then the mayor of the town also runs like a B&B &B, and he's like fostering like a baby goat adorable and like we have like the small town characters and um our girl is also like dealing with a lot of family stress back in Chicago and she's also gotten out of this like really terrible breakup where this guy was like kind of emotionally abusive to her and it's just like it had everything I love in a romance which is like a lot of like emotional depth like I like a little bit of an angsty romance but it also had like the sweetness and fun and levity of a small town romance and I just felt like Abby Hemnes balanced those two perfectly Next up we have a romanticy. I want to read more romanticy this year. I want to read more of everything. I didn't have a great reading year last year. I want to read double as many books this upcoming year as I did last year. But romanticy is a genre that either does me like real dirty and I hate it or it's one of my favorite books ever. And Start by the Wings of Night was an absolute favorite by Carissa Broadbent. It's this book that is often considered like a vampire hunger games. I think that's because there's like a game at the center. But it's a world in which vampires rule and humans are kind of like a sub- class of, of citizens, but we're following this main girl, Oraya. Oraya is like a human, but she's been uh, like adopted by this vampire king. I, there's a story of, I can't remember exactly the details especially the details we know at the beginning, but uh, essentially she's being raised in this palace that is full of vampires by her like vampire king that is like protecting her for some reason, and she's a human who has been just like trained and is constantly having to protect herself even though she has kind of a little bit more status. The re that's the reason she decides to enter these games that are going on every, f I don't know, decade, every century. There's this game that takes place in which all these vampires in Orea this year come to compete and at the end the winner, the last one standing essentially, um, gets like essentially a wish from one of their their goddesses. They come down and they grant them a wish and she's gonna participate so she can like be granted immunity essentially so she can be, so she can't just like die. Okay, but this is a hard competition even if you are not a human girl in a world of vampires because not only are they like at risk of like killing each other but there's also all these like challenges they have to do and these tasks that they have to complete like within that and it also is taking place in like a giant manor <laughs> instead of like a Hunger Games style arena we're in like this giant manor and um yeah it's really good. Anyway, she's in this giant manor. She winds up striking up with this, like, tentative alliance with Rain. Rain, who's, like, a vampire that is from, like, a different sect of the vampires then. There's, like, political tensions there. Um, and they wind up striking up, like, a very tentative alliance. And, obviously, romance ensues from there. It's so good. As a girl who grew up on Twilight, like, I will always love, like, a good vampire novel. And I'm always on the hunt for a good vampire no novel. This was the start of a, like, series of duologies. The second book is already out. So, like, Rain and Araya's duology is complete. But then the next one is going to be in the same world, but it's going to follow a different couple. And I love that setting because I think the hardest part for me of getting into a fantasy series is, like, learning the world. And I, like, ugh, always drag my feet starting a new fantasy series, even though they're my favorite things ever. Because, like, it always is a struggle to learn the rules. So to, like, have multiple romances that are going to take place within the same world it seems truly ideal. Next up I think we have the only thriller on this list and that is a recent read. I read this like in that week between Christmas and New Year's so a good thing that I didn't put, record this video before that and that's None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. I had seen this on a lot of people's favorites lists already and so I decided to pick it up. Everyone was saying like it was a really compelling interesting thriller and I found it similarly like really compelling really interesting, really fun. Um, essentially, we're following these two women, Josie and Alex, and they meet each other like in the bathroom of this restaurant on both of their birthday. They're birthday twins. They're both like 45. Alex is like a successful-ish, like she's not a huge podcast. She's a small podcast. Her husband is like very wealthy. She has like very young kids. She's like kind of living this like very idealized life of 45. And then we have Josie who is having like a very different experience. Her kids are fully grown. She had them when she was quite young. And so they're like out of the house or not. Her husband is like 70. They like, there's like a weird age gap there. And her life is not as ideal and she convinces Alex or 
trying to convince Alex that she should, Alex should do her next podcast series because her first podcast was based on a very successful woman. Josie is trying to convince Alex that she should do her next podcast on her. She's like, I'm about to change my life. I've like realized that my life doesn't look like how I want it to. I'm like, going to change it. You should document the process of me changing my life and like how I got here and then how I'm going to get out of it. And it winds up working and these women from these very, very different worlds wind up striking like a very tenuous sort of like a friendship relationship as they explore what is going on with Josie. And it is so twisty turny. I read it in like a single morning and I like woke up very early one morning. I was at a cabin with my family and I was like the first one awake and I just like sat on the couch and like finished it by like 10 a.m. because I just like sat down and read it because it was like twisty and gripping and like such a unique premise I think I've mentioned it before but like there was a while there where I was really struggling to find thrillers that I was enjoying just because I felt like a lot of them um had like a very similar structure and it was like not a fault of these thrillers but it if you're following the same structure, there's only so many like twists and turns you can take. And if once you've kind of experienced them all, you can start to feel a little bit of burnout. And so I kind of step back from thrillers and I feel like I'm able to step back in. Now I think we've kind of moved away from like the husband, wife, domestic thriller. Like the husband has like an evil, evil basement room where he's locking his wife. And I feel like this was such an interesting like domestic thriller and that we're like taking place in the lives of these women um, that did not at all follow that like classic husband, wife, husband, evil structure. I'm editing right now and I just realized that I like totally missed a book and I, this is important to me so I'm coming to you live from my computer screen. This is actually my phone. Um, to tell you about the book I forgot. Um, it is out there by Kate Folk. It is a collection of short stories that is like speculative horror science fiction. I don't even know where you would class it. It is so good. So fantastic. I loved these short stories so much. They're so weird. They're super duper weird and they range on like a wide array of topics as short stories do. So I like won't get into specifics, but like if you really enjoy like a short story collection, particularly if you loved like Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado, this gave me like a similar vibe, um, a little bit lighter, but like weird speculative stories about everything from like AI to what else were there stories about dating apps and end of the world situations. It was brilliant, amazing, I loved it so much and um, I highly recommend it. Okay, we're in our top tops. These are like my top, 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 top tier books for 2024, 2023. My next pick is a fan fiction, and I have talked about my relationship with fan fiction a few times here because I always put it in my wrap ups because I think it should be treated like fiction in terms of like wrap ups and things. Um, I made like a whole video where I talked about like Silver Flames and fan fiction because I read Silver Flames and Manacles at the same time. It was a choice, and I think it's a great choice. I don't read a ton of fan fiction. I think I read like two or three, finished like two, maybe three fan fictions this year. They were always Dramini because that, that was the best one. Sorry, sorry, don't come at me. Um, and I will DNF easily, fast, fast on a fan fiction, because a lot of times these are lengthy, and we don't have time to be reading, like, average to subpar fan fiction. That being said, if you have amazing reminding recommendations, please leave them below. Because, like, sometimes I'll get in a mood and the only thing I'll hit is a Germani fic. Okay, so, that being said, what Germani fic made my best books of the year? That's right, it's Draco Malfoy and the Mortifying Ordeal of Being in Love. This book, this book was a five-star perfect rom-com. I know I said earlier that, like, my favorite rom-com of the year was, like, part of your world, and I did love that book. This book was perfect. This book was perfection. Perfection. I was giggling and kicking my little feet. Um, I was kickling, okay? That's what we call it when you're kicking your feet and giggling. Like, the whole way through, it had every single trope that I love in a romance novel. Tropes I didn't even know I loved in a romance novel. It was just, like, perfect. It was perfection in a rom-com. It was so good. Let me explain the premise. Okay. <laughs> so this takes place post-war both Draco and Hermione are full adults um Draco is now like an Auror he's been like all of his crimes from like Battle of Hogwarts stuff have been forgiven Hermione is all the things she's a scientist she's a doctor she's a lecturer she's a professor she is amazing obviously she's a busy lady <laughs> and she is doing some research and we don't know exactly what this research is we just know some bad people are kind of upset about the research she's doing and she's in danger. And so they take Auror Draco Malfoy and they say, look after Hermione Granger. And so he's in charge of keeping her safe. So it's kind of like a bodyguard romance, a little bit. Um, but also like second chance, but also like enemies to lovers, also like friends to lovers, also like everything. And it's, it's a long book, okay? If it was like a book, it would be a chunker. 
But like I I loved every minute of it. Every single minute of it. I have truly no notes. Like just the perfect rom com. Like if you love rom coms, <laughs> if you have similar tastes in rom coms to me, I like cannot recommend enough checking out this book. I do think you need to probably have like a passing knowledge of Harry Potter, but honestly the movies would probably suffice. The movies would probably suffice. I don't think we're that deep in the lore. Maybe we are. Ugh, it was so good. It was so good, guys. Um, I would not lead you astray. Yoke by Mary H.K. Choi. This book was on my list for so long, um, and I kind of knew, based on some of, like, the triggers, that it was going to be something I needed to read when I was in a great headspace. Glad I did. I'm glad I waited. This book does have some, like, heavy content. Would look up triggers and be, like, very cognizant of them because they're very present um it deals with like cancer and grief and eating disorders and like sister and family dynamics and things um in a way that is like very i think authentic just be aware be careful with yourself but it follows these two sisters jane and june they are the daughters of immigrants and they're both in their 20s jane is in her early 20s she's like 21 ish and then june is in her later 20s and is Old. so Jane is like really struggling to get by she's like in fashion school she's barely making ends meet she lives in this like horrible apartment roommate situation there's just like bad news and then we have June who is like in her late 20s she has this like finance job she's doing incredibly well for herself has like a beautiful apartment is making a lot of money and they both live in New York but like their lives don't intersect that often because they're living in such like disparate places and they're forced to intersect when um June becomes sick. Um, I won't get into kind of too many specifics because I don't want to like, I don't remember what is revealed early and what's revealed later. This was something I read earlier in the year, but I just thought the depiction of their sister relationships and kind of the meanness, but also like the tenderness that takes place between sisters. Um, I think there's like a certain level of like viciousness that, uh, is present in most relationships between sisters and I think you really see that in this book but I also see think you see the incredible like love and tenderness that um also exists between sisters and I just thought it was like absolutely stunning just an absolutely gorgeous read that really cut to the core of like what it means to be sisters and as someone who is a sister as you might have noted from a couple of these books I absolutely loved this book it was like ouch like it was an ouch book to read but like absolutely gorgeous stunning amazing Okay, and then third place might be a surprise. Like, honestly, a surprise to me. It's a reread. And normally, I don't count rereads. I don't care if you count rereads, okay? You don't need to fight with me about, like, whether rereads count or not. I don't count rereads because I would reread the same three books over and over again. It would be embarrassing for me. My recaps would look the same every month. They would. That's my what I want in my heart, and I know that's not the best thing for me. So I don't count rereads in my overall book goals, but I do sometimes if they're really, really old rereads. So this is a reread that I read when I was in high school, when I this book first came out, and that is Mockingjay by Suzanne Collins. I also got swept up in the Hunger Games hype. I read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes because I wanted to go see the movie, because honestly, because the Olivia Rodrigo song slapped, and I wanted to go see the movie. And so I read the book first. The book is better than the movie, so Ballads of Songbird and Snake, but it honestly does not even touch her original trilogy. After that, I wanted more Hunger Games, so I went back and read the really original trilogy. And like I said, I read that book series as it was coming out. I was in high school, like young high school too. I think I was like a freshman, um, freshman, sophomore, junior, I guess. So I would have read, read this when I was like 16. I don't have a lot of strong impressions about the later Hunger Games books. I remember reading the first one because I was like, not to brag. But I was, like, on top of it. I was reading that first Hunger Games book, like, days within it coming out. I remember Stephanie Meyer had posted on her blog that she, like, really recommended Hunger Games when it came out. And I read it, like, immediately after. Like, I was, like, the OG of the Hunger Games girlies. But I don't remember the later books. I don't have strong memories. But reading The Mockingjay, which is the third and final book in the Hunger Games series as an adult, was just, like, such a different experience, I think, that I would have had when I was in high school because of how bleak this book is like the, the ending of this book is just like so bleak the first two books we have not to spoil things for the hunger games i'm not going to get into details but like the first two game or the first two books we have games like we have hunger games that are at the center and there's something about even though we're watching these and we're like this is terrible these are games where children are murdering each other there's a bleakness there there's a little bit of like spectacle that is like f enjoyable to watch and that is not what's happening in this last book in this last book we are really dealing with the repercussions and the aftermaths of revolution and war and the ending gutted me gutted me like ruined me <laughs> I was sobbing at the end of this book in a way that I don't think I did the first time I read it. I don't think it hit me the same way. And I think uh, just knowing kind of like the realities of current events and what's happening in the world, 
this book hit me different. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was fantastic. If you haven't read these books since you were a kid, I would really recommend rereading them. I think Susan College did such an amazing job. You can tell that there are books written for teens. Like they read incredibly fast. You can like burn through the books themselves in a couple hours each. But she is able to like really capture, I think, the like horrors of like war and the cost of revolution absolutely beautifully. And this book just, it ruined me and I like, I feel like it earned a spot <laughs> in my top three. Okay, number two is the book that I really thought. I read this book and I was like, this book is definitely gonna be my favorite of the year because it's one of my, like, it's definitely like in my favorites of books of all time. And that is Babel by R.F. Kuang. This is a historical fantasy novel um, that takes place in eight, 19th century Oxford largely it takes place kind of in a few places but largely in 19th century Oxford it is like mostly historical with just like a dash of magic and the dash of magic is in this world um magic is done via like translation via language on these silver bars so these silver bars and they'll just put two words on them and the magic takes place in the translation between those words the magic system is fascinating and amazing but the thing that really made this a top tier favorite was the conversations around the intersections between academia colonialism and language like there were so many times I had to pause this book and just, like, think things. Like, this book changed my brain. It changed my mind. It changed the way I think. I think about this book all of the time. R.F. Kuang is, one, brilliant. She is actually currently getting her PhD in some sort of linguistics at Yale. <laughs> While she's just writing these novels one a year. How is she doing it? She's so smart and beautiful. <laughs> How does her brain fit in her head? Um, but I just thought this novel was amazing. I think it gets a lot of critiques for being a little bit more academic, but I just loved that about it. I just thought it was fascinating. I really enjoyed the story and I connected with the characters. Um, but the thing that really sold it for me and the thing that made it a five-star read was the way that she explored language and the way she explored colonialism and its intersection with language in academia was just like stunning. It like truly it brought up things I'd never thought about before. It changed the way I thought about other things that, like, you know, highlighted things that I had already thought about a lot. And it was just, like, so good. So good. I'm obsessed with that. And that brings us to our, our final read of... Well, it wasn't our final read. I read this in, like, the summer. But my favorite read of 2023. And that was Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. Okay. This book is so hard to describe. And I had heard people talk about it a lot of times before I finally picked it up. And the way all of them described it was not... It didn't tell me. This book is so good. I'm going to try to describe it to you the best way I can. And then I'm going to, because I think the plot description won't do it justice. I think there's like a level of like cheekiness and a level of like humor and a level of like darkness mixed with like lightness that is just delicious. And it's my favorite thing on the planet. It's so hard to find, first of all. And then to find it and have it done well is just like top tier. Okay. Let me try my best to explain this. So we have two line, timelines. In the present day, we're following a movie production based on this book. Okay. So the movie production is based on this book. We have the author there and kind of two, two main actresses that we're following. The book is based upon our second timeline. Our second timeline takes place in 1902 at this boarding school, where, which is actually where they're filming the movie. A lot of overlaps. Um, in this boarding school where we're following a string of deaths, these like suspicious deaths that happen that are connected to a different book that people are worried like maybe has like demonic stuff happening. It is so good. I like, ugh. I like when I cop it to some, I want to compare it to some things so you can maybe get a sense of the vibes and if this is for you. I think this book reads like sapphic lemony snicket. I do. I do. And that's not something I say lightly. I think it has that, like, series of unfortunate events sort of tone. We do have, like, an active and present narrator, which I loved and well. And there is, like, a sense of humor with these, like, dark events that I think is just, like, perfect. It is sapphic at the boarding school, like, our girlies, like, the headmistress and, like, I don't know, she's a teacher there. They're, like, in love and, like, living in a committed relationship. Um, and so we're following like that and also like there's just like some sapphic relationships happening between the girlies too because there's like no boys There's some boys in the like present-day timeline unfortunately, but like mostly it's just girls having a girly good time though There's like spooky wasps Which is like bizarre It is giving i'm trying to like compare it to some other things. It's like horror comedy But done horror comedy sounds terrible. Okay, it does but it's giving like scream queens by ryan murphy a little bit It's giving like I said, Lemony Snicket a little bit. The show Pushing Daisies, if you watch that, I love that show. Um, do you know that season of American Horror Story? I think it was like Roanoke, where there was like the reality show that was taking place at the haunted house. It's kind of giving that a little bit. I like, can't explain this to you, but I just like know for the right, and I don't think everyone will love it, but like if Lemony Snicket 
writing like a sapphic version of American Horror Stories Roanoke sounds like it'd be a good time to you. But this book is for you. It is. It's so good. Uh, you'll just have to trust me. Oh, and also, before I leave you, two things about this book. One, the audiobook is stunning, phenomenal, amazing. I love the audiobook. I listen to the audiobook. But you also need the physical book because the physical book has illustrations. Like, it doesn't have a ton of illustrations. It's not, it's not a picture book. But there's illustrations throughout, and it's so good. It's so good. So I had the audiobook and the physical book, and I was reading along with both of them at the same time because I couldn't let go of the narrator because she was stunning and amazing. But also, I, like, needed to look at it with my eyeballs. It's so good. Ugh, I can't talk about this book enough. I, like, want to hype it up, but also it's hard to talk about. Anyway, those are my hair books of 2023. Despite the fact that it was, like, a not great in quantity reading year, it was a pretty good year in quality. I think my average rating was, like, a 3.89, which is, like, pretty high for me. I had a lot of four-star reads, had, like, a decent number of five-star reads, had a lot of 4.5 reads. Like, all of these are four fives or 4.5s obviously. Those were my favorites 2023 reads. Let me know below if you have any recommendations for me. Based on those, those favorites are any of your favorites, something you think I would enjoy. I love favorite season because I get so many book recs. It's my favorite time of year. That's all. I will talk to you next time. Bye!